Um, thank you, Suru. Thank you, Ursula. Thank you, Art Territories. And uh, I would like also to thank all the people uh, in the room because uh, most of them are uh, uh, personally uh, inspirational to my practice and to who I am right now. And uh, I really, uh, I mean, I think this is a wonderful opportunity for everybody to start these kind of discursive uh, moments in our uh, Palestinian struggle. Uh, against occupation. I think uh, that kind of occupation is something that we have, this form of occupation that is really uh, newly emergent in uh, the Palestinian territories that we have to discuss further and further. Well, my presentation has no title. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm bad at titles. I'm always selecting the wrong titles mostly. And uh, people would not, never understand what I'm really aiming at. Uh, so uh, I was supposed to, I was asked by Shuru to talk about the my practice at the uh, Birzeit University and, uh, and also the way education is, is really tackled there, especially in the architectural uh, department where uh, architecture becomes not a utilitarian discipline, it becomes, uh, it becomes a material for thinking and a material for uh, discursive discussions and uh, criticism, let's say, to the context. And I think that kind of transformation was triggered also by the, uh, uh, the emerging, new emerging situation and the transformation in our cities, which really uh, stunned and startled architects and started uh, ac academics, uh, I mean, academicians, uh, and uh, made them stop and think and look uh, at what's happening and try to theorize what's happening. Uh, so. For me, architecture and urbanism are particular to other forms of cultural production in, in a sense of reflecting in their physical manifestation the socio-economic relations and the economy of the place, uh, and also the power structures which is really forming the space. Uh, the daily experiences of urban forms and their visual experiment experiential qualities give architecture and urbanism important cultural values grounded in everyday politics and everyday uh, practices, uh, living practices. Therefore, the production of space, as I think, uh, uh, in, uh, the production of space is really important in breeding these kind of uh, hegemonies in the space and understanding uh, the uh, uh, power relations between the different actors that are shaping the space. And in Palestine in particular, uh, we have witnessed the transformation, a rapid transformation of a, uh, since Oslo agreement and the space was really interrupted that, that uh, uh, triggered us to really read that kind of power uh, structures and try to understand what's happening because it's all, as Shuru said, it's interrelated to the politics and interrelated to the, uh, the, the, the political form that is really happening in Palestine. So we woke up suddenly after a decade of Oslo agreements to find out that architecture has become a means of transforming urban realm into containers, stacking people, homes, businesses, companies up on each other and branding the city uh, with what is available only via liberal market. The temporality of the urban space and the tendency of replacement becomes a norm, where liberal uh, destruction of what has not an exchange value has also become a norm. The hegemony of exchange value makes the city mobile, movable, and transformative, like a container harbor, but with slower tempo. When a society loses its organic connection with, the, with its history, geography, climate, traditions, language, and value, uh, urban space becomes a purely functional setting, uh, like the containers of the harbor, uh, based largely on utilitarian considerations uh, that can be easily copied and transformed from one place to another. This containerization of urban space and fragmentation of the humane processes essential for the production of urban space, has its roots in the history of colonial fragmentation policies in Palestine from, I mean, the fragmentation from geography, society, culture, and environment. And this phase of what I call neo-colonialism, or neo-colonial era, which is also the neoliberalism, has become a systematic tool of fragmenting what is remaining, shifting the long history of a political resistance and struggle against occupation to a neoliberal project, which becomes the project of achieving the Palestinian dream. However, the classical mode of colonial systematic transformation of occupied territories ceased to be valid in this particular time. The form of the occupation regime 
transformed from the state of physical presence of its institutions, armies, and personnel in the occupied territories to a withdrawal from the archipelago of cities and towns in areas A and B, which, uh, which comprise 38% of the West Bank. Uh, to Area C, which is 62% of the West Bank, where the military control and administration is under Israeli military. It is the age of security, as Foucault would describe, reminding us with the spatial origins of this kind of territorial control through going back to plague regulation, plague yani ta'un, of the 16th century Europe as a good example of security mechanism that interwove both disciplinary and juridical techniques and transformed them to curb the risks of plague, which is terrorism in Palestine. Uh, quoting Foucault, these plague regulations involve literally imposing a partitioning grid on the regions and towns struck by the plague, with regulations indicating when people can go out, how, and what time, and they must, what, what they must do at home, what type of food they must have, prohibiting certain types of uh, contact, contact, requiring them to present themselves to inspectors and to open their homes to inspectors. Uh, end of quote. It's not a classical occupation, it seems. Uh, the next step in the, this plague regime, I mean, when you have a plague in the archipelago of Palestine, the next step was taming the rage of the contaminated, curing the plague, sustaining containment of the plague without being contaminated, without a leak. So the, uh, control re the regime of control is really interested in containing that con kind of contamination, as Foucault would really uh, refer to, without being contaminated and without having a leak outside this archipelago uh, that uh, is created. Foucault also goes back to explain how the security mechanism investigates the possibilities of knowledge about the space in order to plan for control using juridical and disciplinary measures altogether. So I replace the word criminal uh, in an example given by Foucault in his 1977 lecture on security with the word Palestinian and the word state with Israel. And, uh, it's just an experiment uh, to see uh, if the questions that Foucault was really trying to use in order to see how the, uh, control regi the regime of control uh, would uh, examine uh, a space in order to plan for security. So this is the quotation. The general question basically was how to keep the hazard and risks caused by pa Palestinian revolt, both in terms of people and local, and translocal political institutions within socially and economically acceptable limits for Israel and around uh, an average that will be considered as optimal for a given social and political setting. The, uh, the security mechanism that uh, uh, asks questions that predicts future and try uh, for uh, uh, questioning the future knowledge that is necessary to control a space was, uh, was always depending on the idea of that the uh, control does not really know exactly what's happening and it's a process that is going into the normal life of the control. As Shuru would say, you think, you, you wake up and you see that, oh, the economy is happening really rapidly in Ramallah. I mean, we want an economy, uh, and I mean, it's good to have more wages. And but with the, uh, uh, there's no self-questioning about that because it's really something that is really entangled within the daily life of uh, Palestinians. The Palestinian Authority was established with, with all what is entailed from executive and governance bodies to control and administ administer the contained and contaminated in the archipelago of areas A and B under limitations enforced by Israeli security measures on mobility, exports, imports, donor policies, public and private institutional structure, democracy, governance, government, and spatial production, all under the name of security. The assimilation of the plague from being a collective political struggle for freedom and independence to individual consumerist project Invading each family house started by means of neoliberal peace that where economy becomes the key for the anticipated cure and the PA becomes the inter internal confined administration designed for governance and assimilation process administering the inoculation of the contaminated and preventing a leak.
And this is the, the symbol of olive tree and, and the transformation of the olive as a symbol of struggle, roots, and re our relationship with our culture and uh, into an, econ an exchange value in uh, the investment conference. And this is Palestine now. It's really how to sell olives more and how to sell uh, our roots more. This is what the, uh, what's happening right, right now. Looking at the motto of the annual Palestinian Investment Conference, one could see the transformation of the symbo uh, symbology of the olive tree, which has always meant the roots, the connection with the land and the landscape, the core of the struggle against occupation, has now purely become a resource for investment. A new era where everything is subjected to a new uh, value system, neoliberal values. Again, uh, quoting from Eric Hobsbawm uh, from The Age of Empire, this, this tightening web of transport uh, drew even the backward and the previously marginal into the world economy and created a new interest among the old centers of wealth and development in these remote areas. Indeed, now that they were accessible, many of these re re uh, regions seemed at first sight to be simply potential extensions of the developed world, which were already being settled and developed by men and women of European stock, uh, extirpating or pushing back the native inhabitants, generating cities and doubtless, in due course, economized civilization. The European may come in small numbers with his capital, his energy, uh, and his knowledge to develop a most lucrative commerce and obtain products necessary to the use of his advanced civilization. Now, going back to the plague in the archipelago, after understanding the administration of the cure and inoculation inside the archipelago, Ramallah seems to be the perfect haven for the commencement of this neo-colonial liberal control mechanisms and the cure. Uh, and eventually, people inside Ramallah, as you may notice uh, yesterday, maybe at night, if you go, uh, hallucinating, sort of, a, uh, they have a sort of a hallucination as part of the treatment from the plague, to dream of independency and state building within the borders of the cities, uh, area A and B, as if the Palestinian struggle is put to uh, an end and it's reach, reaching an ultimate dream of independence and freedom. Therefore, the current rapid change in the form of the city is understood as a norm of the current victorious political conditions. While problematizing the image of the city, including the emergence of new urban forms in housing, commerce, and militaristic structures which invaded our cities now nowadays, has not been seen as an aftermath of a colonial political conditions and power relations, uh, neither in the academic nor the inte intellectual discru uh, uh, discourse till now. I want just to show you some images now, remi uh, reminding us with the tour yesterday and all these changes that happened in Ramallah that uh, we've encountered yesterday and all the discussions that we have. Banks and credits, uh, everybody, all... Uh, oh, shit. I'm sorry. And I'm changing the presentation, but... I'm sorry. So this is uh, the Palestinian Authority and the establishment of the Palestinian Authority next. This is the banking. I mean, banks are thriving uh, in Palestine. It seems that capitalism has found a new geography to examine. And uh, everybody, everybody is on uh, credit and everybody is on debt for the rest of their lives, sometimes for 20, sometimes for 60 years. Uh, you can see now transnational projects happening in Palestine, funded by the Gulf and sometimes the U.S. aid and sometimes uh, some donors that, uh, sorry, investors that we don't know their origin. And you can see Ramallah full with signs of these projects nowadays, predicting the uh, future of the uh, space and the future of what is Palestine is due to, to become. I promised you yesterday to have a look at one of the projects, which is uh, PIF's business desk district, which is really huge. And if you look at the image and you can see another Dubai landing from the sky on the earth, that's, that's on your uh, right.
this is actually uh, a new image of that place. So, I mean, you see the transnationality invading the space and uh, a space which is not even, a, 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 it doesn't have a state to really decide on its, uh, its uh, mechanism and its future and the vision of the future. And it's already going inside our cities and spaces without even having the, the chance to say yes or no or to modify what we see as Palestinians or, or what we think about the future of Palestine and our space. Uh, as we also see the, uh, the relationship between already existing new housing projects and uh, uh, settlement patterns, uh, we can see Psagot, uh, this is from Decolonizing Architecture. This is Psagot uh, settlement and uh, down we see an image from Rawabi and we can see the way we deal with landscape and we deal with the, the housing, this similar, similarity with the colonial uh, mechanism of uh, looking at space and uh, uh, defragmenting space and also controlling the tops of the mountains and also creating gated communities and elitism within the uh, kind of planning for uh, these housing uh, projects. So this is sort of similarity and parallelism without really being conscious about what we are producing in that kind of, in this neo-colonial uh, uh, era. The two photos, one of them, the housing project we had a look at yesterday, which is the diplomat housing project. And uh, the other one is Bitar Elite Colony. And you can see the similarity of our spatial production. I mean, uh, it looks the same. Uh, this is another image uh, from, uh, one of them is Mali Adumim. Colony, and the other one is a Rehan neighborhood, which we also see, saw yesterday, and you, saw, you see the planning. And by doing this, we're losing also the uh, sense of architect, the connection with the heritage. And it's always, uh, we have always project that is starting anew. There's something like a trend that we destroy everything that we had from the past, and we start building something from new. Uh, instead of investing in uh, uh, the existing rural uh, areas and try to uh, make them available and, you know, try to prepare them to, to be suburbs for, for our expansion of the cities, we are uh, building new uh, settlements and we're trying to demolish new landscapes instead of really investing there. Uh, this crisis that we have, uh, yeah, yeah, any architect, I mean, we don't look at the architectural history and the use of spaces and also the architectural elements that provided the common. I was thinking so much about Alessandro actually. When I tried to see why the architectural image is really uh, disturbed and it's so much colonial like. And I discovered that there's a loss in architectural elements that produced a common, uh, uh, produced these kind of social relationships, such as such as the you know small plaza, internal gardens, the corridors between the urban blocks, uh, the uh, uh, loggias, uh, the porticos, the. Uh, uh, I can really name a lot, uh, and uh, these, I mean, we have a loss, so all the housing projects that we're having nowadays, they lose such uh, public and such common uh, uh, architectural elements that upstairs, for example, that is really connecting one place to the other. So it's always like a container. I mean, it's just that you have several containers and you just squeeze people inside each container, and, and beca architecture becomes as a way of containment and uh, it, uh, as if it's really reproducing the colonial uh, uh, strategies. And also there's a social reproduction of the uh, uh, mili mil militaristic uh, architecture and we really copy the wall, we copy the watchtowers and we insert them in the political structure because these are the new headquarters for the Palestinian uh, Authority in Qatarat in all over Palestine and if you look at them I mean they really resemble I mean there's a sort of fear from that kind of uh, political entity towards it's as Reza Shahada yesterday say towards the people I mean if you look at it you are started by the fact that this is a defense thing and then you're the enemy and they're really afraid of you as a person passing by that kind of architecture and there's also a destruction of the the heritage that we used to have to all, all the old architecture I mean uh, as if we started celebrating Palestine through Ramallah uh, since the Oslo agreement as, in, as if Ramallah never existed before so all the heritage that is really uh, was reproduced the cinema culture that was in the 40s and uh, 50s Ramallah had four cinemas Nablus had five cinemas now they're all destroyed I mean famous Egyptian actors actors and actresses uh, where there was an exchange in the geography and that was all forgotten yeah this is Nadia Lutfi a famous uh, 
uh, Egyptian actress. Uh, so, I mean, uh, it's a sort of after also there's a, a, a rubbing to the whole history and there's a starting anew. And that's what's happening here. It's just starting everything from uh, scratch as if there's nothing. It's as if the, the land was really empty. And, and that's the, the way, I mean, if you look at the, the way Israel uh, uh, was really describing the land, it was really empty when they came. It was the land of scorpions and storms. And we're doing the same. We really, as if uh, we, we don't attach our Ourself with the uh, past, we don't really go from the basement with, with the foundation which was really strong and rich. We don't go from there up, we scratch and we start anew. So this anew thing is a, a, a syndrome that is happening nowadays in the cultural scene, in the architectural uh, realm and in the economy. And the, uh, the economy which does not adapt with the past now is really pushing towards that kind of uh, starting anew. Also, there's, uh, I think Lisa talks so much about that, and that was an inspiration for her, the re-emergent or reinvention of the middle class in uh, Palestine, and the idea of also going back to Ramallah syndrome, the hallucination of the middle class inside Ramallah with a freedom, with an independency inside the bubble called Ramallah. And suddenly, everybody thinks that we are not under occupation. We have our banks, we have our schools, we work, we get money, we want a better job. And the whole Palestinian struggle suddenly uh, faded away and we dumped everything on the Palestinian Authority. All the political struggle that was a collective and that was uh, co coming from the roots, from, from our networking and from our uh, uh, social, uh, rich social life has disappeared and now individuality has become the norm and uh, the disconnection from the uh, our, free, uh, our uh, political struggle has also uh, become a norm. and. Uh, uh, for me, uh, uh, it's not the idea of criticizing the nightlife of Ramallah, but the nightlife of Ramallah has, has become an end. It's something that, this is the ultimate dream, is to have a nightlife in Ramallah. I'm not criticizing the nightlife. I mean, I'm, I'm part of the nightlife of Ramallah, but the idea, it becomes an end. It becomes like, this is, this is it. This is life. We're now freed of occupation, and that is very scary not to be critical to the... Um, uh, 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 to the context and understanding the uh, uh, the transformation, the social and also the economic uh, services to the place. Uh, there's also a transformation in the uh, uh, in the civil society organization. Bizet used to be one of the active uh, civil society organization academic institution and was really a leading figure in the political struggle. Uh, teach, both teach staff members and uh, students were really leading a strong uh, movement in the 70s and 80s, denouncing Camp David, for example, a constant demonstration against uh, uh, occupation. Also surveying, I mean, the type of knowledge that they were interested in was, was destroyed Palestinian villages, uh, trying to go to refugee camps to pave. Uh, remember yesterday's uh, Jalazon refugee camp? They, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the whole staff member and also the students went there to pave the uh, roads of the refugee camps and to clean it. And there was a constant initiative from, uh, coming from the students and from the staff. Now we don't see that anymore. Uh, also going to Nazareth and the, connecting with the 48 Palestine and connecting with the Palestinians from the 48, going to Nazareth, having initiatives in uh, voluntary days in uh, Nazareth uh, was something. And they, they were really interconnected at that time. Now, I mean, yesterday I was very shocked. I mean, it was really a wonderful experience, Shuru, that you uh, took us to the uh, your housing project, the visit. But then, I mean, we I was shocked to find out that each of these, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, I mean, I'm not offending anybody, but I was shocked to, for the fact that these uh, uh, Bizet teachers now are sitting on a uh, $600,000 house. I mean, each unit costs 600000 more than half a mi million. And uh, most of them are really, would really be very afraid and uh, intimidated by the fact of losing that kind of uh, money. So they want, uh, and then par partially, most of them are also part of the building of the Palestinian uh, uh, authority, uh, ministers in the ministries uh, borrowed here and there to this uh, ministry, and I think uh, it dismantled sort of the uh, the activism that was once at Bizet University and its role in really waking up the society and producing a knowledge that is. Uh, uh, critical to what's happening and really making people look at 
the society with different lenses and look at the society in, uh, uh, in a different discourse uh, from that of the economy or of that of politics. I was, I was listening to a friend of mine, Adania Shibli, the characters, she's a writer, and she really was talking about her characters inside uh, her novel. And she discovered once, she woke up and she said, my God, I'm trying so hard to let my character outside that room. And it's been 45 pages till now and the character is stuck on that bed in that small room. So what's happening with me? Uh, she tried very hard to uh, make the flow of her story to push the character outside, at least outside the house into the courtyard, but she couldn't really. So she started wondering why is that happening with her. Uh, she uh, started researching different writers in different stages where the geography also was really different at that time. And she discovered that when the geography was more uh, uh, connected with the Arab region in, uh, during the Ottoman uh, Empire, for example, people, writers like Khalil Sakakini, used to travel all the way from Ramallah to Jerusalem to uh, uh, Damascus to Beirut and for them, traveling was really a norm. I mean, seeing these people, I mean, describing how many people he's seeing. I mean, it's like Ramallah now. We, when you move, you see people you know. But Khalil Sakakini, it was in the whole region. When he moves from one city to the other, he meets people he knows. And therefore, uh, the, uh, his characters uh, in his uh, description are moving uh, distances. And uh, from one page to the other, they move uh, uh, hundreds of kilometers while Adaniya is stuck in that room. She also tried to go to uh, also uh, examine uh, 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 Emil Habibi, uh, who, who, was the, uh, who, was, uh, 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 who experienced the Nakba in 1948. And she also tried to, uh, when the geography was really sh shrinking down to uh, the second photo, the uh, partition, partitioning of pa Palestine, and uh, she found out that the characters now are more limited in space and the character it takes them more time to move in, uh, from one city to the other. There's more descriptions and instead of one page like uh, traveling 100 kilometers, it's also the time is collapsing and also shrinking inside uh, 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 the writing. And she jumped also after 1967 to the writing of uh, uh, Sahar Khlefe. And uh, uh, she also finds that things are becoming slower and takes more time to dis uh, describe uh, one character doing an activity in space. Until she realized that now, uh, looking at all your new writers, I mean, she, they're all stuck in uh, that kind of... Uh, so shrinking space means shrinking mind and sp shrinking knowledge production. and. Uh, small, uh, the tempo is also going slower and slower. And I think that's what ha what's happening with us. I mean, we cannot really, we're so bounded by Ramallah, and the, not, the production of knowledge is really going slowly and slowly because we are really bounded to that place. Um, so, what kind of, uh, I'm, I'm uh, in the end of my presentation. Uh, can we, I think this is the wrong presentation. No. Um, <laughs> Yeah, leave it here, on Emily. Um, uh, uh, so my inspiration normally comes from those people around me, and I'm not really, uh, I'm, I'm not really producing my. I'm, I'm really inspired by the people around me. I'm inspired from so many people from different disciplines, and uh, when. Uh, Asking them, I mean, I want to quote certain people, one of them, Emily Jasser and uh, uh, Raja Shahade, and also want to, um, uh, also Munir Fashe, would, I would quote a little bit from each one of them as source of what kind of education uh, we need and how, we deal, uh, how would we, should we really deal with the uh, education, because education is very important. We need to produce, uh, we need to use the civil society, re reclaim the civil society institution and really rec reclaim spaces to produce alternative knowledge that of the economy and the politics and really to produce spaces that uh, make us really w uh, uh, wear binoculars and new lenses to look at what's happening here. Uh, so with a, an interview with Emily Jasser, uh, from her experience in the art academy and the role uh, uh, she's really taking place in, the, uh, uh, in her education in the art academy, she said something like that. 
well, actually, this is the thing. That, before discussing my teaching practice, I want to preface this by uh, uh, noting, or maybe I should say emphasizing that though many in the international community uh, treat us as if we are a sovereign nation with full jurisdictions over resources and our territory, we are still under occupation and we continue to suffer Israel's work in progress. There is an increasing encroachment of colonial spaces such as settlements, military areas, checkpoints and bypass roads. We do not have freedom of movement within our, uh, our country. Half our people can't get in and half can't get out. As an educator in Pal Palestine, I implement a multifaceted approach uh, to my teaching practice as a way of dealing with our complex and fragmented situation and as a way of resisting Israel's matrix of occupation. It is imperative to me that the international histories and concepts that I teach are taught hand in hand with local histories and practices with attention to the particulars and specifics of our space. I'm also committed to continuously gathering our uh, uh, dispressed historical trajectories together in the classroom. In an effort to deal with the, these interwining complexities, I also integrate into the curricula explorations and examinations with my students of the history and work of other occupied spaces and bodies such as Northern Ireland, Algiers, and Southern Africa. These parallel struggles play a central role. Teaching and reteaching Palestinian histories is of prime importance as well as we are living with the constant erasure of ourselves. Uh, one factor which contributes to this cycle of erasure is the large influx and proliferation of international NGOs, artists, cultural projects, which continuously impose structures on us without any knowledge of or awareness of our own educational histories. Generally speaking, the exchange of knowledge in these situations is one directional and implies building the wheel from scratch. One of my efforts to resist this historical amnesia includes constant collaboration with my colleagues who I make it a point to invite into my classroom on a regular basis. Uh, I have also made it part of uh, any class I teach to go on walks. Uh, the, this practice of walking with my student is a form of exchanging and gathering knowledge as well as a way of attuning to the, st uh, to the students to the minute details of uh, facts on the ground which change at an alarm uh, alarmingly rapid rate. This walk, walking as teaching, was handed down to me by Munir Fashe years ago and we continue to walk. This is Emily's way of dealing with uh, education in uh, the Art Academy, and it's, it's nice really to think about um, uh, alternative models of, uh, of examining knowledge in space in, uh, rather than really following the uh, already existing uh, uh, Anglo-Saxon curriculum. Uh, what struck me so much about Munir Fasher was the fact that uh, he's a professor at Harvard, he's uh, a mathematician, and he's uh, suddenly discovered that the math his mother is doing is uh, much better than his math. That he, uh, his, uh, his mother is a tailor and she triangulates fabric uh, specifically to each woman she meets and her math can fit and suit uh, several women while his math only suits uh, uh, one directional, very linear. And he discovered that he wants to, uh, after really discovering this, he wanted to undo all the education that he got in Harvard and uh, so uh, uh, this sort of criticism and this, is, this sort of uh, 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 the way that uh, education has uh, also been a tool of really uh, giving us a narrow way of looking at who we are and our uh, knowledge in uh, our traditional and local knowledge. From Raja Shahada, uh, I want to uh, read something uh, which I, I learned so much because he, he's a lawyer and he's uh, walking in the landscape and he's always registering what he's really seeing and you can really compare the, his registry from the past and, his, uh, and the uh, existing change in the landscape. I want to quote this from his book, Palestinian Walks, I'm sorry. I survived my uh, prospects. I could not go to Ain Kenya through the Abu Amin track because much of it has been destroyed by new buildings in the course of Ramallah's expansion 
uh, to the northwest. Added to this was the fact that the Jewish settlers from Doleb and Bet Il had raised money to build a bypass road through, the, uh, through our hills and valleys, going over private Palestinian lands to connect their two settlements. This badly designed private road caused much damage to the hills and obstructed the passage of water through the wadi. It also destroyed a number of the springs and many unique rock formations, among them a beautiful cliff studded with cyclamens uh, that I often stopped to admire. Uh, as to the valley to the south where I found the dinosaur footprint, it was now used for target practice by the members of the Palestinian security forces. At night, one could hear the staccato dribble of their guns. Its access to Ain Kenya was also blocked uh, by the army post on the hill, uh, hillock, uh, owned by the Rabah family about 550 yards down from the uh, uh, military post. So I decided to consult a map of the hills. I had to. It was not a practice I would have chosen, or it implied submission to others, the makers of the map, uh, with their ideological basis. I would much rather have exercised the freedom of going by the map inside my head, sign posted by historical memories and references. And I want to end by mentioning uh, Khalil Sakakini or some... Uh, uh, I think Khalil Sakakini, who used to. And also, yeah, Khalil uh, Ahada. The, the educators, the, the uh, educators uh, from the past have really discovered the, the idea of change since the beginning of the uh, British mandate, and they decided to really uh, uh, create some new uh, educational system because there was a sort of invasion of the. Uh, 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 Anglo-Saxon way of doing edu education. So people like Khalil Sakakini and others, they've been really uh, into walks. They, they walked the whole landscape from, uh, from Safa to uh, an, uh, an Naqab and they've walked each day and they've learned through walking and uh, that was a sort of a tool of learning and really being really aware of the change in the environment. Now uh, we're, doing, uh, we're working on a project in Sebastia uh, and we've discovered when we've done a social mapping that the, uh, the, uh, how the people, the ge different generation were using the landscape, we discovered that the older generation were using the landscape that connected their village with other villages and they were always using that kind of uh, territory. And then the younger generation have smaller territorial use of space at, until you find a new generation they only uses use their houses and all the, the public spaces and there's a shrinkage in the relationship between the younger generation and with their landscape. So walks are very important as a, a medium of re establishing this connection and that kind of no local knowledge and transformation. Finally, I want to talk about my inspiration that comes from decolonizing architecture and uh, the way Alessandro, Sandy and the rest of the crew has been uh, stimulating uh, the way I think about architecture and also the way I deal with my students eventually uh, is rethinking architecture and rethinking architecture as a material of uh, thought and not a utilitarian uh, discipline like what the neoliberal economy is really doing. It's just utilizing everything for uh, a function. So uh, that's it. Thank you. architects were educated abroad and then they came and built here and also me I was educated abroad so in a certain way I wasn't educated about the environment the landscaping the traditional architecture how much today does the universities architectural faculties emphasize on the heritage because it was very interesting yesterday when we went to Rawabi and he emphasized a lot on sustainable development so if we look at traditional architecture we have a perfect model of sustainable architecture which is in the use of material that creates environmental friendly houses. Like the stone houses, they're very same, unlike the concrete houses. He was telling to us, uh, uh, for, I think he was emphasizing really much on the use of stone. So using the local stone that they're carving out of quarries nearby and not having them to ship them all over while they're just putting the stone on the facade, which is not really, has no environmental, um, how to say, attribute because the stone isn't anymore, it doesn't have any insulation of value. 
as it used to have in old houses. So the old question is, um, does the education today emphasize on traditional architecture or not? Does it teach history to its students or not? Uh, it's not what's inside the curriculum, and I think as an architect, as an educator, and I think it's not about what's happening inside the curriculum. It's what's ha it's personally inside the teacher. It's all related to the uh, uh, the the architect. I mean, the, te the the one who's really conveying the experimentation and knowledge. I don't want to uh, make it a, dictator, a dictating relationship, but I think it's just all. I mean, in. Uh, uh, it's the idea of the method of teaching. When you look at things, you have to go look at the uh, historical and traditional social values. So it doesn't matter. I mean, I'm not with the this uh, segmented uh, way of teaching things like you only teach history in this class and uh, you teach sustainability in the other class. It's just